Station Houston on Space to Ground 2. You ready for the PAO event? Ready. Houston Station, we're ready for the event. Copy. Neil Middle School, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Satan. Station, this is Neil Middle School. How do you hear me? Neil Middle School, we've got you loud and clear aboard the International Space Station. Hello, my name is Isaac. My question is for Don. Can you explain using the restroom in space and what is done with the waste? Oh, uh, can you, uh, to, to use a restroom in space is not that much different than using a restroom uh, on Earth. Uh, you uh, go in, you got to turn on a machine, and uh, you have a hose with air going in it, and then you have a bucket with air going in that, and uh, when you're all done, you seal everything up and turn it off. Hello, my name is Isaiah. My question is for Dan. How does NASA transport astronauts to and from the International Space Station? Okay, in general, we use rockets to get to and from the International Space Station. And up until last year, we had the capability of using space shuttles to do that, and the space shuttle helped us build the International Space Station. Right now in the United States, we're developing commercial vehicles. There's a whole series of them right now that allow us to transport humans to and from uh, the International Space Station from planet Earth. And uh, the three of us, along with our three uh, cosmonaut colleagues, all came up on a Soyuz rocket um, about four months and six months ago. Go, respectively. Um, hello, my name is Adonis. Uh, my question is for Andre. What happens if there is a fire or emergency evacuation needed? Yes, we are, of course, in a, in a closed environment, and there are uh, several types of emergencies that uh, can happen here. And one of them uh, could be a fire. Uh, we cannot just uh, leave the house, uh, as would be wise, uh, because we are, we are stuck here. So uh, we have to deal with the fire ourselves. It means that we have to protect ourselves against the smoke and toxic gases. So we have masks with special filters for that. And we have, uh, uh, of course, uh, a lot of fire extinguishers. And one of the most important things is to, to cut the electricity. Uh, and that is how we will deal with the fire. Uh, remember also that uh, the materials here are very safe, so that the chance of a fire is is very, very small. Another problem, um, another problem that can happen, of course, is a hole in the space station because we are maybe hit by, a, by space debris. This is also very unlikely. Uh, so we are, we are very well trained uh, how to deal with that, quickly close hatches and try to find the leak. So uh, uh, we are well prepared, but the chances are very small. Hello, my name is Mara, and my question is for Don. What experiments are currently being conducted with NASA on the International Space Station? We have two general categories of experiments. We have life science experiments, and most of those are experiments that we do on ourselves. We're looking at how human physiology adapts and behaves in a weightless environment over long periods of time. And the other category of experiments are physical science experiments. These are things that involve growing crystals or combustion, which is a fancy term for burning things. Um, and, and these are the kinds of physical experiments, uh, surface tension experiments, uh, experiments dealing with convection and diffusion. These are the kinds of physical experiments we do. And then we have yet another category of experiments. We call these engineering experiments. And these are things like making uh, new uh, versions of our life support systems, being able to recycle our water, and things like that. Hello, 
my name is Jasmine, and my question is for Dan. What is the most amazing and unique thing that you have seen outside the window while in space? That's a tough question to answer because uh, there's almost every day you see amazing and in. Uh, and um, unique kinds of things. And probably in general, the most amazing thing is planet Earth. When you see it from 400 kilometers above, it is absolutely breathtaking. It's constantly changing. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at uh, mountains like the Himalayas or auroras or, uh, or the oceans and coral reefs, uh, some of which will span hundreds and hundreds of miles beneath you. All of it's absolutely spectacular. Um, for me, individually, probably the most amazing thing I saw was the rising of a comet uh, above the uh, horizon of the Earth just before sunrise over Australia um, back around Christmas time, back in December. And the comet was named Lovejoy, and it was spectacular. And it was just uh, one of the most incredible things. Uh, we were flying, like I said, a little bit north of Australia at the time. There were thunderstorms, and uh, the whole Earth beneath us, from our perspective, was just lit up with lightning flashes, and they would reflect off the space station. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, as the sun was getting ready to rise, there was this uh, long, bright arc that extended from, her from the horizon all the way up from my perspective, all the way up behind the Japanese module, the Kibo. And uh, it went uh, many, many degrees, and I had no idea what it was, and it wasn't until a day or so later that we realized that it was a comet that had just barely grazed the sun and survived that close encounter, and uh, in so doing, sent off all kinds of gas and dust uh, streaming thousands, millions of miles out into space, and uh, it, was, it was pretty, pretty incredible. Hello, my name is Lisi. My question is for Andre. How do you prepare to go into space for so long? Uh, that's a good question um, because yeah, it's it's not very uh, normal to be uh, uh, in a space station for uh, say six months. Uh, uh, we we train a lot on all the different modules, and during that training period, we are a lot away from home because that is of course one of the things that is uh, uh, less uh, less nice that you're away from your family. And uh, uh, but because we we travel so much and we we, we train in, in Japan, in Europe, in in Russia, all over the world, uh, and therefore we already are used uh, a bit to to being away from the family, and the family is used to that then, uh, as well. So that's a way to prepare uh, from from that point of view, and uh, to prepare to live and work here in the space station uh, means that we we. We train on all the equipment and all the, the the procedures that we have to do in all these places all over the world, and that's a training of several years. So uh, it, it's not easy uh, to uh, to to live and work up here, uh, but the training is excellent. Okay. Hello, my name is Jalen. My question is for Don. I have an interest in getting a doctorate in astronomy. What are the requirements to become an astronaut? The requirements for becoming an astronaut, if you look at them on a piece of paper, don't look like they're all that much. It basically requires a degree in a technical field, and that's science engineering. And that's really all it takes. And, and what you really need to do is follow what sings to your heart. So study a technical field that you're really, really interested in, do really, really well in that field, excel in that field, and then apply to become an astronaut. Hi, Hi my name is Kidacia. My, my question is for Dan, Don, or Andrew. Can you show us how to do a flip? I thought you'd never ask. The neat thing is you can do them really, really slow.
you notice if you stretch out, you go slowly, and if you make yourself into a small ball, you'll spin very fast. And, and that's called conservation of angular momentum. And what Andre demonstrated is uh, there's no conservation of position. You can change your orientation just like a cat can. And I think Andre must be part cat because he just demonstrated you can change your position in space, your, your orientation, without uh, exerting an external force. Hello, my name is Leander. My question is for Andre. What do you do for fun on the International Space Station? Well, you just saw it. Uh, this is one of the things we can uh, we can do for fun. So uh, it's very nice to uh, to be weightless and to float. So we do our, uh, our aerobatics, uh, and uh, that's just one thing. But also uh, the fact that uh, items float and and water droplets. Uh, so these are nice things uh, to to play uh, to play around with. So these are uh, interesting things. And of course, uh, it's fantastic to look out of the window and uh, see this uh, beautiful planet and the stars. Uh, so uh, there's enough already in the space station. But beside that, uh, we also, uh, for example, uh, as a social event, uh, we watch movies together, we, uh, we have dinners together. Uh, so uh, we have plenty of, uh, of activities uh, to, uh, to have fun on board. Hello, my name is Brianna, and my question is for Dan. Has the International Space Station ever been hit by space debris? That's a good question. Um, up here, we have a lot of um, a lot of potential things that could hit the space station um, in low Earth orbit. Down on planet Earth, there's a lot of air, and that fluid, that uh, that medium, slows things relative to other things. So you generally don't have high velocity unless you put a lot of energy into something. So it takes an airplane with a jet engine to get going many hundreds of miles, for example, an hour. Um, up here on space station, things are. Uh, are moving quite fast because the there's almost no air, almost no. It's a, it's nearly a pure vacuum outside of out of outside of here. So if you get debris that gets captured, um, it could be uh, cometary debris, uh, things that make meteors, shooting stars that you'd see from planet Earth, uh, that might get captured by Earth's orbit, or Earth may just wander into it. Um, if you have uh, debris that's left over from old satellites or rockets or things like that, all of that potentially poses a threat to space station. Thankfully, nothing big has ever hit it. Occasionally, small things do hit it. If you do a spacewalk outside, you'll see very, very tiny little, little holes in uh, in some of the uh, the structures outside. Now, the space station is shielded. We have uh, two layers of uh, of metal cladding, metal shielding on uh, on most all of the space station, so it can uh, the first layer can uh, basically vaporize, if you will, most of uh, little things like that that would run into it. We got very good protection in the form of radars and very radars on the ground and uh, very very smart people that are that monitor low earth orbit and look for things that we might run into or might run into us so on occasion if we do see something and have enough time we can actually move the space station to avoid it if we don't have time and we see something then what we can do is close all the hatches to make station as secure and safe as it can be and then we can go to our soyuz um, space vehicles and basically wait and if there is a major problem we can always come back to earth Hello, my name is Tanaya, and my question is for Don. How is International, International Space Station affected by solar storms? Uh, solar storms, uh, we are pretty much protected by the Earth's magnetosphere uh, from solar storms. We're pretty much outside of the atmosphere. We're above most of the Earth's atmosphere, so we don't have atmospheric protection like you do on the surface of Earth, but Earth acts like a giant magnet, and, and that magnet the magnetic field extends way out into Earth, for uh, out outside of Earth, thousands of miles, and and uh, that protects us from solar storms. Hello, 
Hello, my name is Sinclair. My question is for Dan. How do you feel about public space tourism? In general, I think uh, most all of us that are in this business would love to see more people in this business. So I think the more means, the more ways that we have to get to space, the better. I think the more people we can have that fly in space, the better. I think when all of us were growing up, we thought by this point now, there'd be thousands, tens of thousands of people living in space all the time. Well, it turns out flying in space is pretty tough. It's pretty hard to do. And there's a lot of challenges to it. But we're now getting to the point where companies are able to develop rockets that we think will be safe enough that we'll be able to have more and more, more, more and more people fly to space. Um, they'll be coming to space station. Uh, they'll be going to other places. We'll build other space stations for them. And ultimately, I think all that's going to help humanity leave planet Earth and uh, go to other places we'd like to be and extend our presence out into the solar system. My name is Nana, and my question is for Andre. How do you get your supply of water and oxygen? That's a very good question. Um, these are uh, uh, important resources, as you can imagine. Uh, so uh, we have to be smart, and uh, we uh, are trying to uh, say to, to model the Earth and uh, we recycle uh, the water as much as possible. So that means that the water that we, that's in our breath or that uh, that from from, from uh, sports. Uh, so all the water that we create uh, is being uh, being used again to and purify meaning also the urine. Uh, so all the water in the urine is, is being purified and we, we make the drinkable water out of that. Then this is linked to another system uh, which uh, divides the water into hydrogen and oxygen. So we get our oxygen partly from from uh, the, the water. There are other uh, systems as well uh, uh, that create uh, oxygen, but uh, of course we, we're trying to recycle as much as possible what we have because everything you launch into space is uh, is weight and is costing a lot of uh, money. So uh, I think this is uh, fantastic equipment we have we have up here uh, and which could be uh, uh, of of great uh, advantage for for uh, such systems on Earth as well. Hello, my name is Dewan, and if my question is for Don, and if I get permission from my parents and money's not a problem, can you take me into space with you? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, saving your nickels to pay for a way into space is going to be easier than getting permission from your parents. <laughs> Uh, however, if you can get permission from your parents, the next time I fly into space, I'll, and if you aren't too big, I'll figure out how to pack you into my suitcase, and you can come with me. However, uh, more seriously, what you, what you should do is, is save up some of your money, maybe ask your parents if you could do extra chores so you can make more money, and then you can use that to either go to some form of a space camp where you can learn about space, or maybe go to a community college class where you can learn more about space, and by doing that, it will set you up so that by the time you finish up with college, uh, you won't need to worry about buying your way to space. You can come and join NASA, and they'll send you to space. On behalf of Neal Middle School, we want to say thank you so much for being with us today and answering our questions. Neal Middle School, International Space Station, it was our pleasure. It was our pleasure to have you aboard today, and uh, we wish you all the very best. And station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you all. And uh, thank you, participants at Neal Middle School Station. We are now resuming op operational audio communications.